Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you. So, you've decided to join many others in the world of Azeroth, as it was in 2004 to 2007, referred to as Vanilla or Classic. I'm sure you have many questions, the biggest of them probably being, what class should I play? As you would imagine, classes have changed and evolved in a huge way over the years, almost unrecognizable from Classic to Current, so in this video, I'd like to give a brief rundown of each one and go over their roles, responsibilities, niches, perks, and just how they played as a whole. Now, this is a pretty exhausted subject on YouTube, I think. Class guides are all over the place, but something I've noticed is that they're usually more aimed for the hardcore audience, with most of the talk being about the end game and tier lists for DPS, healing, or tanking aimed more at people who've maybe played on private servers for the past several years, or at least have a base knowledge of the game in its vanilla state. So since that's been covered really well by people much more knowledgeable than I, for this video I want to take a much more casual approach, assuming that the last time you played Classic was 12 years ago, or maybe you never had the chance to play it at all. I'll go over each class in the end game and talk about their responsibilities and what roles that they generally landed in. But I won't go super detailed and get into spreadsheets or anything like that. So if you're looking for a very high level detailed guide with class rankings and whatnot, you probably won't find this video very enlightening. But if you just had the thought of, eh, I'm not sure what class I want to play, let me search YouTube, this might be helpful to you. At least that's what I hope. The first thing I'll say is that each of these classes in the game have very specific roles that only they can fill. It's one of the more defining aspects of vanilla actually. Today, things have sort of melded together. Most classes are capable of really good AoE DPS, where maybe back then it was the mage's specialty. And today most classes have some form of stun, which was primarily a rogue attribute back then. Everyone is super mobile, has oh crap buttons, big DPS cooldowns. Everyone can do everything basically. This wasn't the case back then, and it has its good sides and downsides. A downside, obviously, is that the balance is questionable. There were certain specializations that you rarely saw because it was still the early stages, and a lot of this was still experimentation. But a good side was that the roles that you could fill were the roles that you could fill, no one else. It gave you more value and a sense of identity. People saw different classes join, and they reacted differently. It was something like, oh cool, a warlock. Now we can summon, and we also have that handy soul stone if we wipe. Or, oh nice, a shaman. Now we get to have that party-wide wind fury buff. I can guarantee you that this will be one of the first things that you notice if you pick up Classic, and it's part of what made it so special back then. Before we get into the classes though, I should also go over how talents worked since I'll be mentioning specializations quite a bit. Talents back then were much different. You didn't outright pick a specialization which gave you certain spells. You had access to 90% of your class's abilities regardless of the spec, and putting points into certain trees would just increase the power of those abilities. For example, as a mage who has more points in the frost tree, you still have fireball, Fire Blast, Scorch, and Flame Strike and whatnot, but they just won't be as powerful as they would be if you had more points in the Fire Tree. So, later on, if I say Fire Mage or whatever, try to disassociate that with today's system where for the most part, Fire Mages just have Fire Spells, or only Assassination Rogues have Poisons. Your toolkit is tied to your class, not your specialization. I just wanted to mention that, since it's one of the more confusing things for those who never played before the Cataclysm expansion. So, in no particular order, let's start with the Warlock. This is a pure DPS class that specializes in Shadow and Fire Magic and is supported with a wide variety of curses and other afflictions to wear down and debilitate your foes. You also have access to a varied selection of demons to accompany you in your journeys, each with their own role to fill. Their three specializations are Affliction, Destruction, and Demonology. 
Affliction improves your damage over time effects to give your enemies a slow but steady death. And Destruction more focuses on your big hitter spells such as Shadow Bolt or the instant cast Shadow Burn, a more direct way of dealing damage with big crits and much more volatility compared to Affliction. And as for Demonology, as you'd guess, this improves your ability to summon demons, increasing their health, damage, and much more. As for your roles, Warlocks are the ultimate wingman class. They're just great to have in the party. They're the only ones who can summon allies, which is especially important back then since meeting stones didn't summon, and with no flying, traveling was much more cumbersome in general. Their soul stone was quite unique and much more valuable back then as well. Only this and druids had the ability to resurrect during combat, although back then you had to apply the soul stone before the target died, so sort of a preemptive battle res. Most of the time though, you just threw it on a healer, and they only used it after a wipe so they could res up and save everyone a run back. They're also the only class that can reliably crowd control elementals with their banish spell, which was castable in combat and has no cooldown. You pretty much needed Warlocks for the Gar fight back then in the Molten Core. He had a bunch of mini elementals running around, and unless he had a bunch of tanks, it would be wise to have a few Warlocks on banish duty. They arguably have the most useful debuffs in the game, with curses that reduce the resistances of enemies, so all of your spellcasters can pump out more damage. Their fierce spell is one of the better crowd controls, particularly for PvP. It's castable in combat and at range with no cooldown, and it didn't immediately break on damage, which made it very tough to deal with. And another defining spell is their life tap, which trades life for mana. Mana management wasn't just a thing for healers back in the day. DPS also had to use their resources wisely, or risk being unable to cast anything. Today, most DPS classes have it just to have it. It's inconsequential 99% of the time. The one exception, I think, is the Arcane Mage. So, if mana management isn't something that you're too keen on, Warlock is a great choice for this spell alone. It gave them an edge over other casters in the game. They could also make Hellstones, which were just as valuable back then as they are today. Vital to have, but realistically, you'd save them for the tanks because they required soul shards to make. Which brings me to my next point. A quirk with Warlocks back then was that their soul shard system wasn't tied to your character like how it is now. Rather, it's an inventory item, and to gather them, you have to be draining the soul of the target when it died. Certain spells require these soul shards to cast. The Ritual of Summoning, Hellstone, Soul Stones, Every Demon Summon, excluding the Imp, and even combat spells such as Soulfire and Shadowburn. These took up an inventory slot, and back then, as infamous as it was, they didn't stack, so you were constantly playing this game of keeping an ample amount of these shards to make sure that you could cast all of your spells and make your stones and whatnot, and at the same time trying to save space for quest items and loot. So, some will find that aspect frustrating, but they're just so useful to have that it's completely worth it, I find. If your goal is to make friends in this game, I always say to make a tank, a healer, or a warlock. Any of those, and your friends list should fill up pretty quickly, because people will always want you around. So, for endgame, you're a great support class, and you have great prospects in both PvE and PvP. Rating-wise, you are hindered a fair amount due to the debuff slot limit. Back then, your whole raid was limited to 16 debuffs on one target, so being a class that has a wide variety of damage over time spells and other debuffs, you may feel quite restricted in the raiding scene. If your focus is raiding, I think most warlocks drift away from the affliction tree in particular because of this limit, and they still do alright for themselves. But again, that's mainly raiding we're talking about here. Casual dungeons and PvP, it's no holds barred, so you're free to do whatever you want. Because of this, they're quite deadly in the PvP scene. You just have so many choices of abilities to cripple or encumber your enemies, and with mastery of all of your demon summons, you could overcome nearly any obstacle. So, just a great utility class, while still having some bite for actual DPS, which is why I like them so much. Since we're talking about DPS here though, another hugely different thing in Classic we need to talk about was Threat. 
today, it's really just the tank's responsibility to hold aggro on everything, and pretty easily done at that. You taunt it, and you have it forever, unless you forget to press buttons. However, back in vanilla, it was more of a group effort. Remember that old Anixia wipe animation? Very, very slowly. Now. And by slowly, I mean fucking slow. If you get aggro, it means you're going to lose 50 DKP because you didn't know what the fuck to do. He wasn't joking. Threat was much harder for tanks to get, and if the DPS went balls to the wall, they could very well rip aggro from the tank and wipe the entire raid. My guild personally did the three sunder rule. Warriors had the sunder armor ability, which was the main threat generator, and it stacked to five, and usually when they got to three, you were okay to start DPSing. Not necessarily pop all of your cooldowns and the ham, but you could at least start to ramp up at this point. So, you have to take this into consideration when talking about Wait. DPS. Warlocks do great damage in the later tiers. Their Shadow Bolts hit extremely hard, but the downside is that they have little to no way of reducing their aggro other than just not attacking. There is an argument to be had between having medium damage and good aggro control versus high damage and no aggro control, so definitely consider that if you're looking for the class that deals the most damage. It's a double-edged sword. Next, we have the mage. Anyone who's played RPGs before should know the basic gist of this class. You wear dresses, and you command the power of frost, fire, and arcane to freeze, incinerate, and disintegrate your foes. Their playstyles are quite varied, Fire spec is more based on huge bursty damage to kill your enemies in the blink of an eye. A lot of the old PvP videos, you'd have what were called 3 minute mages, where with cooldowns, you'd be able to instigate people with giant pyroblasts. It's pretty much the definition of a glass cannon though, and you forego defense for the sake of all out offense. If that's not your style though, you also have Frost, which is much more methodical and more catered towards defense through slows, roots, and barriers. You have much more control in general compared to the fire spec. And as for your arcane school, this is where a lot of your utility spells lay. Just to throw out some examples, you have some supportive spells such as your arcane intellect, the ability to dampen and amplify magic, dampen decreases magic damage and healing received, and Amplified does the opposite. You also have a shield, which absorbs damage in exchange for mana, the blink spell to create some distance, and some damaging spells such as the channeled arcane missiles for steady damage, or the AoE arcane explosion. They still had a lot of handy abilities that we have in the current game, the main ones being the ability to conjure food and water, and also portals to major cities. It's just that back then, with gold being so hard to come by, and traveling being so time consuming, they had much more value compared to today. Just keep in mind, if you play a mage and you're hanging out in your major city, you will be asked for food and portals. It's just a fact of life. Some of the more industrious mages even made quite a bit of gold selling portals to major cities back then. You needed a reagent to open one up, so there was some justification in charging a price for them. Their sheep spell was the most diverse and reliable crowd control in the game. No cooldown, testable at range, and it worked on humans and beasts, which most of the dungeons were comprised of, and combined that with the challenging nature of dungeons back then, and thus the need of CC, mages were always great to have in the group. And its usefulness in PvP is also pretty self-explanatory. In the raiding scene, you'd always want at least a few mages there for food and water, and for their damage too. As I remember, they did pretty good. An interesting quirk that I should mention though, is that back then, and this is for any class, not just mages, but enemies did have resistances, so you might be stronger or weaker depending on what you're killing and how you're specced. For example, the Molten Core. Being the home of the elemental lord of fire, Ragnaros, it had many enemies who were resistant to fire magic, so a fire mage would find themselves quite weak here, as you would imagine. And elsewhere, as a frost mage, there are some other fights that are unfrenly to them. It makes sense if you think about it, 
Especially if you played the old Final Fantasies where you had to find an elemental enemy's weakness. It's just one of the old RPG elements that I thought was worth mentioning. Since mages have access to three schools of magic though, they can adapt a bit better than other classes. Whereas Warlock is mainly Shadow and some Fire, you can use Fire, Frost, or Arcane, which gives them an edge in certain fights. Proficiencies like Stealth, Subterfuge, and Assassination. They have a wide arsenal of stuns, slows, poisons, and other debilitating effects to ensure that they're always in firm control of any skirmish that they come across. That is, if they so choose to engage. Being just one of two classes to have the stealth ability, the rogues have the advantage of staying in the shadows and striking or disengaging when the time is right. Just the sound of a stealthed rogue nearby is enough to send chills down a player's spine because they know that they're being stalked and at any moment you'd hear this. If your goal is to make other players angry and snap their keyboards in half, this is the class for you. They're offensive juggernauts, holding a wide variety of robust cooldowns to kill their enemies in the blink of an eye, and at the same time, many abilities and traits that made them extremely evasive and nimble. Because of this, they're extremely deadly in PvP in the right hands, and are considered among the best as DPS in the PvE scene as well. They use the energy and combo point system. You build up energy over time, and you have combo point builders and spenders as your resources. You have three specializations to choose from, and that's assassination, combat, and subtlety. The combat rogue is a toe-to-toe -to -toe swashbuckler designed to simply overpower your target, typically focusing on one-handed swords or maces, but there were some dagger builds as well. Usually though, if diggers were your weapon of choice, most of your points would land in the assassination or subtlety trees. Assassination increases your burst damage and improves your poisons, and subtlety refines your stealth and your ability to sneak through the shadows, as well as giving you more cooldowns to set up more efficient kills. As for some of your specialties, you have the ability to pick locks, which can make certain dungeons easier, or let you open up black boxes. This is another skill that players will make gold from, offering to open lock boxes for a small sum. Another quirk with them was that to use your backstab or ambush abilities back then, you actually had to be behind your target. It does make sense, it is called backstab after all. So positioning was key, and if you or your opponent was lagging, PvP would be quite tricky to pull off sometimes. And as for leveling as you'd imagine, most rogues would invest points into the combat spec. It's hard to backstab when enemies are constantly facing you. They're also the only class that can disable traps, making them quite good for PvP, but even in certain areas in PvE as well. They have a wide variety of poisons at their disposal, as I said. In Classic, we actually had a whole profession to craft them. Direct damage, damage over time, slow, healing reduction, casting speed increase. Pick your poison. They're applicable on the fly, so you can adapt to any situation that's presented to you. And going into more detail with their evasiveness and defensive capabilities, you have Sprint, which increases your movement speed, Evasion, which increases your ability to dodge, and Vanish, which immediately puts you in stealth to hide yourself from your enemies. With these cooldowns, you can escape just about any situation, which is another reason why they're so deadly in PvP. Being able to choose your fights gives you such a huge advantage. Compared to other classes, they don't have as much utility in the realm of group buffs or long-lasting crowd control. Their weaknesses are their cooldown dependent 
And as far as everyday dungeon crowd controlling is concerned, they just have sap, which is only usable on humanoids, and without a certain talent, it breaks you out of stealth upon cast, which also makes it quite dangerous. I remember back then, sometimes to get in groups, people wanted me to have points and improved sap, but since it was quite deep into the subtlety tree, I never had it since it would hurt me in raiding, and respecking back then was very costly. Their main saving grace is that their kick ability was the most reliable interrupt in the game, having a short cooldown and castable any time as long as they have the energy. But where they maybe aren't as useful compared to a warlock or a mage in group utility, they make up for in pure raw damage. They're famous for being one of the powerhouses of vanilla, and one of the reasons for that is because they excel at aggro control. They have the Faint and Vanish abilities in their toolkit, which complements their potential for high DPS really well, because you have more freedom with how much you can actually attack, without pulling aggro and wiping the entire raid. That's the main reason why I liked Rogue so much back then, and why I raided this one for most of vanilla. So, PvE or PvP, you just can't go wrong with them. It's truly a class to be feared when you play properly. Hunter is an expert scout and marksman who favors a bow, gun, or crossbow as their weapon of choice and are accompanied by their trusty companion pet. They are a fourth and final pure DPS class in the game, and they hold a wide variety of devastating ranged attacks to decimate their foes from a distance and a small arsenal of traps to keep them out of harm's way. If that fails them, however, they have a respectable amount of melee strikes and a ferocity that's matched only by their beast companions. Bears, leopards, spiders, wolves, the wild holds endless potential allies for the hunter to tame. Some are as common as a household cat, and others are rare trophies that only the most patient can say that they've successfully domesticated. Your three specializations are marksmanship, beast mastery, and survival. Marksmanship, as you'd guess, improves your ability to attack from range, providing increases to your various stings and even the aimed shot ability, which is a skill that takes a few seconds to line up a devastating hit. Beast Mastery improves your animal companions and your bond with them, providing benefits for both the hunter and the pet. A signature spell being Bestial Wrath, which turns your pet into an unstoppable killing machine. And as for the survival tree, this houses many improvements to your traps, melee attacks, and just improves your control in general and your ability to kite. A highlight being your wyvern sting, which is a ranged attack that puts your target to sleep. Some of the unique things going on with them that you may have heard is the fact that they need ammo to fire their weapons. This was taken away in the Cataclysm expansion, but for bows and crossbows you needed arrows, and for guns you needed bullets to be able to attack. To help keep your bags clean, you also had access to special ammo pouches or quivers, which typically had higher capacity and also a boost to your ranged attack speed. You also had the ability to equip melee weapons in addition to your ranged, since hunters really shined at range, these were mainly sought after for the stats more than anything. You may have heard people jokingly referring to every single weapon in the game as a hunter weapon. This is due to their tendency to take melee weapons with little regard to their comrades, even though they don't really use them, either due to selfishness or blissful ignorance. As for the pet system, this was also quite different at the time. Nowadays, pets share the same stats and DPS regardless of what you tame, but back in vanilla, each pet had unique stats. Some were more tanky, some had a really high attack speed, or maybe a slow speed but with high damage, or maybe they had certain unique abilities. For example, the turtles had a nice shield wall which made them quite nice for tanking enemies, and only the boars had a charge which would root enemies in place for a second, and wolves had a howl, which would increase the damage of party members, and so on. There's way too many to list. The way you learn these skills was also pretty unique. Certain pets had certain ranks of these skills, and if you battled with them enough, you'd gain the ability to train their skills to other pets, 
It used skill points, and you had all sorts of abilities and buffs to choose from and customize your pet. Armor increases, certain resistances, and so on. You also had a happiness meter that you had to keep track of. There are three levels, unhappy, neutral, and happy, with a damage modifier of 75%, 100%, and 125% respectively. It decreased over time and was only increased through feeding your pet certain foods, and if your pet was unhappy for too long, it would actually abandon you funny enough. How often you had to feed your pet was affected by the loyalty system, which was another quirk that they had. The longer you journeyed with your companion, the more loyal it became to you, and the less you had to feed it to keep it happy, and it goes on and on. It really had some Pokemon aspects to it. It was quite complicated back then, so it was kind of funny that newer players were often pointed towards Hunter as the first class. That's because they were easy to play at a very basic level, but looking past that, they are actually one of the hardest classes to master, I think. A contributing factor to that being their dead zone. Basically enemies who are too far to melee and too close to shoot. And that's right, if enemies got up in your face, you're forced to bust out your melee weapons and deal with them that way, or find a way to get some range between you. This is pretty easy if you have a pet to taunt it off of you, but up until level 10, you're on your own, so it's a pretty tricky thing to deal with, especially in PvP. It's a constant battle of keeping other players out of melee range, and you can really notice as clear as day the difference between a good hunter and a bad hunter in a PvP setting. Another unique thing they have are traps. You do still have some of these today, depending on your spec, but I think the best way to put it is back then they were much more substantial. And that's because they were vital in keeping distance between you and your enemy, so with the removal of the dead zone, they kind of faded into the background. But back then, you had to master these things if you wanted to be a decent hunter. You had the normal freezing trap, which as you'd guess froze targets, and you also had your frost trap, which was your AoE slow, and there were some damaging ones. Immolation for a single target dot, and explosive for AoE. A cool set of abilities that helped define the class. And I mentioned this earlier, but hunters back then used mana as their resource, which will take a lot of people by surprise I'm sure. So no more focus, which means proper mana management becomes an important aspect of the class as a whole. As for your endgame rolls, your DPS obviously, they aren't the most damaging in endgame rating, but they make up for it by bringing some great utility. You had Aspect of the Pack, which was a group-wide speed buff, the True Shot Aura, which was a group-wide attack power buff, Tranquilizing Shot to dispel enrages, and with your Eyes of the Beast, you made excellent trash and boss pullers, and with your tracking, you can pinpoint the location of certain enemies. It was very common to have hunters as raid leaders back then, and it makes sense. They're the forward scouts of the game, leading their comrades through dangerous enemies and obstacles. They had great aggro control with their feign death ability, so if threat control is one of the more scary aspects of vanilla for you, they handle it quite nicely. Probably as good as rogues, if not better. And in PvP, they were quite deadly if they knew what they were doing. They were a threat to everyone. Any melee if they knew how to kite, healers with their mana drain, and even casters if they had the right pet pushing back their casts. I think if you had to pick just one class to describe as easy to learn and hard to master, it's the hunter. War. War never changes. Since the dawn of humankind, when our ancestors first discovered the killing power of rock and bone, blood has been spilled in the name of everything from God to justice to simple psychotic rage. quintessential melee class of any RPG, the warrior is a heavily armored juggernaut who doesn't rely on cunning nor magic. Rather, they favor their combat prowess and the hefty weight of sharp steel to cut through their enemies. 
Whereas the cowardly hunters, mages, and warlocks take to running from their enemies, the warrior is the one who chases. No tricks, no ambiguity, just pure raw strength and a thirst for blood. Whether it's your enemies or your own is inconsequential, and that's because a unique thing they have going on is their rage system. Through attacking or being attacked, you generate the rage resource which you build up over the course of a skirmish and spend on devastating melee attacks. Their three specializations are arms, protection, and fury. Arms focuses mainly on improving your skill with two-handed blades and some traits that focus on bleeding your enemies to death. It's generally the go-to for PvPers, with their biggest spell in this tree being the Mortal Strike.